As we come to the close of this Father's Day, I realize that many of us are beyond the child raising years. The last thing we need to hear is advice on parenting, years after we could have used it. And as time passes, I realize the the unique challenges that parents face with each child. I can easily identify with the experience of author Charlie Shedd. When he was young in the ministry, he came up with a, uh, a message that he entitled, How to Raise Your Children. And he writes, all over the Midwest, I gave this same message. They paid me a handsome fee, and they were glad to see me. This guy will wow you, is what they said. And the people came. Then we had a child. Those brilliant ideas had a droll sound at 2 a.m. with the baby in full cry. In my defense, I want you to know this. I kept on trying. I changed the title of the message to Some Suggestions to Parents, and I charged bravely on. Then we had two more children, and I changed it again. This time it came out feeble hints to fellow strugglers. So today I seldom speak on parenthood, and whenever I do, after one or two old jokes, you catch this uncertain sound. Anyone here got a few words of wisdom? (laughs) So rather than trying to come up with some novel approach to parenting, you know how hard that is every year, tonight I want to consider measuring the success of a father. Now before you roll your eyes and think, here we go, preacher's going to make me feel guilty again, showing what a failure I am as a father. That's not the point. That's not my intention at all. Far from making you feel worse about your job as a parent, I hope that after this message you'll feel better. Or at least not as guilty as you normally do when you think about the subject. Our problem isn't so much what we do or don't do as parents. The problem is more basic than that. And I think it has to do with our target or our objective. Howard Hendricks points out, If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. One of the reasons why we think we're often doing so well is that we don't know what we're doing. (laughs) Objectives always determine outcomes. Form follows function. You achieve that for which you aim. But many people are like sand dunes. They're formed and shaped by influences rather than purposes. They react instead of act. And I think that's probably something we can all share we've done as parents. Rather than being proactive, we tend to be reactive. And sometimes we're not so pleased when we look back at how we've reacted. But what I'd like to do tonight is take a look at our objectives as fathers and come to a realistic measurement of success. Now, I want to begin by considering success as defined by the world. And as you might imagine, there are many voices on the subject, and they're saying a lot of different things. Some fathers consider themselves a success When their child, usually a son, achieves a certain goal, perhaps one they themselves could not fulfill. These days, probably the best known father, especially for those who follow sports at all, is a guy named LeVar Ball. Now, LeVar Ball himself was an athlete. He was a football player. I think he probably played all sports, but he excelled in football. He never quite made it to the NFL. He played in a kind of a semi-pro league in Europe. He made it to the practice squad of a couple of NFL teams, but he never quite made it into the pros. But he has a son. Actually, he has two sons, but he has a son right now that's about to uh, leave UCLA where he was a a very productive basketball player, and he's going to get drafted into the NBA. But all of the attention is on the father, not the son. 
because he goes around to anybody who will listen, telling him how great his son is, that any team that drafts him will immediately become a championship contender just for having his son on the team. His sons are worth a billion-dollar endorsement deal. Yeah, you heard that right, billion with a B. He, he manufactured shoes, a signature line for his son, and, and realize his son hasn't even stepped on an NBA court yet, but he has already put shoes out there that cost $495 a pair. And he makes outlandish claims that his son a college kid, is already better than two-time MVP Steph Curry and four-time MVP LeBron James. He even claims that he himself in his prime could have taken on Michael Jordan one-on-one. Uh, again, nobody believes this guy, but everybody's listening. And he's creating all kinds of hype. And even while many people dismiss him as crazy... Some even think he may be damaging his son's pro prospects. Others hail him as a successful father because he's making his son famous and potentially more wealthy. Is that what it means to be a successful father? Along the same lines, though not quite as outlandish, former Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden, defines successful parenting this way. Success is when your children turn out better than you. Now, I think that's something that probably a lot of us can relate to, right? We want to see our children do better than we did. We want to see them have more than we had. And that doesn't seem quite as selfish or self-promoting. We really want our kids to have it better than us. There's a sense of selflessness, sometimes even sacrifice, so that our kids can have more than we did or get farther than we did in life. One online parenting expert by the name of Penelope Trunk writes in an article, How to Measure Success as a Parent, that you will judge your parenting on whether your kids have good memories of their childhood. She said that's the measurement of being a successful parent. Another blog suggests that a person can consider themselves a successful parent if in 20, 25, or 30 years, my children can tell me they love me and they're truly happy. I think I hear that a lot too. I just want my kids to be happy. Whatever they do in life, they don't have to necessarily fulfill my goals, but if they're happy, then I'm happy. That's probably the one sentiment I hear most of all. If you ask most parents today, what is my role as a parent? They will say, to make my child happy. And they, they follow through on that. You can tell in the way they parent, that's what they want, to make their children happy. I think, though, that's faulty thinking. Not only does it put happiness above other more important things, it places the emphasis for our evaluating ourselves on the wrong thing. And that's true of all of these ways the world defines success. It's making success dependent upon how the kids turn out. And that's a mistake. Even uh, Trunk acknowledges you cannot judge people's parenting by how their kids turn out. And I do believe she's right there. I think there's a better way to measure success. And that is success defined by the word, the word of God. I do agree with John MacArthur when he writes, successful parenting cannot be achieved by following human techniques and child psychology. True success in parenting only results from faithful obedience to God's instructions for the family. And I do think that's where we have to begin. We've got to get back to what God says. What God says is the role of the parents and the goals we should have with our children. Another resource adds, a successful parent is one who trains up his children according to biblical instructions so that as adults they are able to walk with God and to be his ambassadors to an unbelieving world. In fact, a Christian family should be just an example 
of God's grace. Parents are to foster godly living and godly values in the home through relationships of unconditional love and personal obedience to God's word. The message of godly parents is one of love. We love because he first loved us, the Bible tells us. A successful parent receives fully the love of God, conveys it fully to their children, and helps to create in them the ability to live according to godly values while here on earth. Now, we could spend all evening and probably go into a whole series of messages on what the Bible says about parenting, getting into specifics. That's not my point. I want to emphasize two little words from that section I just read. They are able to walk with God and later to create in them the ability to live according to godly values while here on earth. The important thing here is that we do not measure success in parenting by the outcome, but rather by the opportunity. I have said to many people in various situations, don't judge your success by the results. Whether that's true for firefighting, teaching in a classroom, sharing your faith, or the job you did with your kids, Don't judge your success by the results. Why? Because there's more to the results than what you can control. There are variables that come in that are completely outside your realm that may determine the outcome. And if you hold yourself responsible for what other people do, you're putting yourself in an impossible situation. That's what I like about that that quote from that resource. We are to give our children the ability to know God and to live for him, but if they choose otherwise, that's their choice. And I think in my experience, being around a lot of Christian parents through the years, the one thing I find among almost all of them who have children who are no longer walking with God, who have gone away from their Christian upbringing, they don't go to church, they may not say they don't even believe in God at all. And the parents harbor guilt, saying, it's my fault. I failed as a parent because my kids didn't turn out right. And I think that's wrong. I do not believe we should measure success of parents by how their kids turn out. Because you can give them every opportunity, but they still have to take it. It is still up to them to make those choices. You can't force it on them. We need to really question the assumption that what a parent does can determine a child's fate later in life. I don't believe it's true. And I don't believe that moms and dads should blame themselves for their grown children's actions. Parents can pour as much of their values into them as they can, but in the end, the child must choose for himself or herself. It is true, we are all accountable to God for what we do as parents, but we are not held accountable for our children's choices. And I think that's a message that needs to be preached from pulpits like this. This is a message Christian parents and grandparents need to hear. You can only go so far with your kids, and it's up to them to do the rest. And you can only hold yourself accountable so far. And then your children must assume responsibility for themselves. I don't know if he's still writing today, but I I remember reading a parenting column in the newspapers by a guy named John Rosemond. I don't know if he's a believer or not, but usually he hits it pretty well on the head. A number of years ago, he wrote, The pre-modern mother, this is before the 1960s onset of psychological parenting, The pre-modern mother knew that good parenting guaranteed nothing. It gave the child a good foundation, but it did not guarantee that the child would always make right choices. 
On any given day, a child raised by loving parents who dedicated themselves to doing the right thing always was, and is, capable of bad behavior. Today's mom, when her child misbehaves, is likely to hear a psychological demon saying, this is probably your fault, mom. Your child's misbehavior is proof that you failed in some respect. Such is the devastating effect psychological parenting has had on the self-respect and authority of the American mother, and it is sad. I think the same is true for a father as well. It's true. Every time our children make a bad choice, we look in the mirror and blame ourselves. And I want to tell you tonight, God doesn't do that. We're going to look very, uh, in a very little bit about where that's spelled out very clearly in God's word. He does not hold you accountable for your child's decisions. And we need to hear that, and we need to believe that. Think of it this way. Even God could not guarantee the obedience of his own creation. Now, before you throw hymnals at me and think it's heresy, hear me out. The closest thing, humanly speaking, you could say of God having children would be Adam and Eve, right? He created them. He gave them life. He put them in the Garden of Eden, which I would suggest was a perfect environment. There's a psychologist named B.F. Skinner who says that everybody's a product of their environment. So if a kid goes wrong, it must have been something wrong with the environment. There was nothing wrong with the Garden of Eden. Not one thing. Remember, this is before the fall and before the curse. It was perfect. Perfect environment. He gave them perfect instruction. He said, you can do this, you can eat of any tree of the garden, but there's one tree, and he pointed out which one. You notice God didn't say, there's a tree in the garden you don't, I don't want you to eat from, but I'm not going to tell you which one it is. And as they're walking around the garden, you're getting warmer. No, he doesn't do that. He says, here it is, this tree, I don't want you to eat from this tree. And then he tells them the consequences. The day you do it, you will surely die. We're told that God was involved with his creation, that he would come and walk with them in the cool of the day. He wasn't an absentee father. He was involved in their lives. God did it all right, and they did it wrong. And I dare anybody to go to God and say, you failed. It's your fault, God, that Adam and Eve sinned. That is heresy. That is wrong. But is it any different? than looking in the mirror and saying, I'm to blame for what my children have done, especially when they're grown. I think we impose a lot of guilt on ourselves, and we carry a big burden that we don't need to carry. I'm not saying that it shouldn't bother us that our children walk away from the faith, that they're no longer living for God, or they maybe don't even care what God has to say. Sure, that burdens us. We should be praying for them. We should do all that we can to bring them back. But don't look at yourself and think you were a failure or that it was your fault. It's not. God does not hold you responsible. I would like you to turn in your Bibles because I want you to see this for yourself. I don't want you to think I'm making this up. Ezekiel, Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 18. We could could spend a long time going through this chapter verse by verse. I don't want to do that. If you want to, go through this and, and read everything that leads up to this, but I just want to jump to the conclusion. Look at verse 20. The soul who sins is the one who will die. The son will not share the guilt of the father, nor will the father share the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous man will be credited to him, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged to him. You go back and read earlier in that chapter, and and the Lord spells out to Ezekiel this this scenario. What if a a righteous man has a son and and he's wicked 
Will the righteous man be held accountable for his son's wickedness? No, God says. And if that wicked man has a son and the son is righteous, will that righteous son bear the, the responsibility for the father's wickedness? No. Each person stands before God for their own choices, period. And if it sounds like I'm a little worked up, it's because I am. I am sick to death of people evading responsibility by trying to put the blame on somebody else. Seems like that's the great game of America today. Who's to blame? Because it sure ain't me. I'll blame my environment. I'll blame my parents. I'll blame my genetics. I'll blame, you know, preservatives they put in food. Who knows? Every week it seems like something else comes out to explain bad choices and bad behavior. There was a a shooting in Washington. Somebody shot a number of congressmen. You know what the first thing they said? It's the gun's fault. Give me a break. Cain didn't need a gun when he killed Abel or any other weapon that we know of today. The problem is not what we have, and the problem isn't the world in which we live. The problem is inside. Warren Wiersbe says the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart, and he's absolutely right. And each individual who's ever been born, save the exception of Jesus Christ himself, is born with a sin nature. We are bent toward evil. Every single one of us. There is no such thing as an innocent child. There may be a precious child, there may be a beautiful child, but there is no such thing as an innocent child. Because we are born with a sin nature. And I don't care how godly the parents are, that child is going to have to choose for themselves whether they follow God or not. And I have known many godly, godly parents. Now, they weren't perfect. Nobody is. Sure, they made mistakes in the raising of their children, but they did, to the very best of their ability, follow God's instructions on how to raise those kids, and when those kids got the age to make their own way, they said, see you, Mom and Dad, and they went another direction. And too many of those godly people just burdened themselves with guilt, wondering, what did I do wrong? And the answer is, probably nothing. Let's allow our children to accept the responsibility that is rightfully theirs. And and I'll, I'll be honest with you. I think one reason why we hold on to this concept is that we want to think that if we do the right thing, it'll guarantee that our kids are going to turn out right. Now, I'm not saying that's a wrong feeling to have. We want our kids to turn out right. But if we hold this idea that if I do A, B, and C, then D, E, and F will come, that gives us a sense of control. And I can control, I can make my kids follow after God. God himself can't make your kids follow after him. (laughs) Because he gave them the same thing he gave you, and that's a will. He gave them the ability to make choices. And, you know, human beings have an amazing propensity for having everything they need to make a good choice and still make a bad one. Started with Adam and Eve, and it hasn't gotten any better since. You can provide people with an absolutely perfect situation, and they can still choose to go off on their own. Let them bear that responsibility. Don't take it on yourself because you can't do anything about it. And that's how Satan can handcuff you spiritually into thinking, how can I tell anybody about Jesus when you know, my own kids don't follow him? Satan just won a victory. Oh, I can't serve in the church because, you know, look at my kids. If your kids are grown... If they're outside your home and they're beyond the age where you can enforce the laws, you have nothing to say about it. It is 
It's on them. So I guess I've gone a long way to saying how not to measure success as a father. <laughs> Let's get to what it means. How should we measure success? Chuck Swindoll suggests in his book, Parenting from Surviving to Thriving, the best kept secret of wise parenting is this. The job of a parent is to help his or her children come to know themselves, grow to like themselves, and find satisfaction in being themselves. I found it very interesting that in a, an issue of psychology today, there was an article entitled, How to Be a Good Parent, It's All About You. <laughs> now, wait a minute. It's not all about you. It's all about them. It's about knowing your child. It's about giving them the opportunity to know God and the ability to choose to follow him. Swindoll bases what he writes on Proverbs 22.6, verse you probably know by heart. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he won't depart from it. In fact, I know a lot of parents that say, that, that's a promise in God's word. I, I, I raised that child right, so they've got to follow him. They've got to, you know, come back to God when he's older. That is not a promise, number one. Don't go to the book of Proverbs for promises. Proverbs are just that, they're Proverbs. They're general statements about the way life either should be or usually is. But it is not an ironclad, ironclad guarantee and usually when we read that verse, we think not the way he should go, but the way I think he should go, right? <laughs> I want my boy to do this. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I tried and didn't quite make it, but he's going to. And we all know parents that have tried to force their dreams onto their children. And, and they don't have those abilities. And maybe they don't even have those interests. They couldn't care less about football. And we're trying to, you know, shove them into, into a football helmet, and they'd rather play piano. You say, what's wrong with this kid? There's nothing wrong with your kid. That's how God made him. Literally, the Hebrew in that verse says, the way he is bent. In other words, the way he was made by God. Train up your child in the way God created him, not the way you think you want him to go. Allow him to flourish. Allow him to come to know his abilities, and how he can best use those to honor God if he chooses to. And in his conclusion, Swindoll says, hopefully if we're successful as parents in helping our children know and accept themselves, they will be prepared to handle life in the adult world. I love that. Because that is what parenting is all about. It's not for our children to fulfill our dreams. It's so that they can function as an adult in the world. We talked this morning about being a responsible person and how that brings joy to a, a father. And I believe that's true. We have 18 to 20 years to equip our sons and daughters to be capable adults in the world. You know, I've long held that the number one job of the church within the walls. Now, our goal is a great commission to go and to make disciples, but what happens within the walls of a church? I've long said, number one should be equipping the saints for their ministry. That's based in Ephesians chapter 4. God gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some pastors and teachers to equip or prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we reach unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, which is another way of saying grow up. My responsibility as a pastor is to equip you, to give you the opportunity to grow in your knowledge of the Scriptures, to grow in the grace of God, so that you can then fulfill the functions God created you to do. Things that I can't do myself. It's not my job to do it all. It's my job to equip you to do what you are to do. And I think that applies to parenting. Our role as parents is to equip our children, to give them the opportunities, to build up the abilities God gave them 
so that they can do it if they choose to. But remember, they have to choose to. We can't make that choice for them. We can only go so far. The important thing that a good parent provides his children are tools. And, and that, again, I see that as a pastor. All I can do is give you the tools to do what God has called you to do. But it's up to you to do it. It's up to our children to do it. And these are the tools to cope with a wide range of obstacles that life throws at us. Larry mentioned earlier in our service, we are going to have problems. We cannot protect our children from every bad thing that comes along, whether they're six-year-old, 16, or 60. We cannot do it. But we can equip them to be able to deal with what happens, to give them the tools and give them the opportunity to be a success for themselves. I think a good deal of parenting is realizing our limitations and to prepare our children so that one day, when they do leave home, they're ready to face the world. And they have the skills necessary to deal with the good and the bad, because, folks, the bad's coming. (laughs) It's just going to. That's what we need to prepare them for. You know, and as, as I look around today, and I see young people who need safe spaces when things don't go their way, I have never seen such a thin-skinned generation as the one coming up today in our colleges and in that age group. They feel threatened every time somebody says something they don't agree with. And I wonder, just how much did their parents prepare them for adult life? As I witness the growing epidemic of addiction to painkillers and mind-altering substances, I wonder if the biggest problem our culture faces is a lack of coping skills. We can't deal with life, and so I'm going to try to deaden the pain somehow. I'm going to try to escape instead of dealing with it. Now, I am not trying to dump a truckload of guilt on anybody. Every father and mother who's truly honest, can look back at mistakes made, at opportunities missed. You know, children have an amazing ability of rising above our limitations and turning out okay. I I can't even number the times I've heard my parents talking to other people saying, we have no idea how our boys turned out the way they did, because all they can remember are the mistakes they made. And yet, you know, I look back, I can see a lot of the right things that they did, but it's always the mistakes that come to our minds first, isn't it? Our children aren't perfect, neither are we. And when we accept there are limits to what we can do for our children, I believe that's the first step toward parental success. Because it really comes down to, are our children responsible for themselves? And have we given them what we can so that they can deal with what life makes for them. In my experience, especially with Christian parents, we don't give ourselves enough credit, more than we try to take on more credit than we deserve. If your children are functioning, responsible members of society, you've done something right. Let go of the mistakes that you've made. Allow your children to take the responsibility for the mistakes they make. Release your past and their future into the grace of God and allow him to take care of the rest. And before you count yourself a failure because of how your kids turned out, think about God and how his human race has turned out. Are you going to call him a failure? I don't think so. Maybe we need to back off of ourselves a little bit. Maybe we need to give ourselves a break when it comes to evaluating success as fathers and as mothers and realize what our limitations are, what our responsibility should be. Let our children be responsible as God has created them and let him take care of the rest. 
Let's close this evening in a word of prayer. Father, we sing a lot about your grace and your love and your mercy, but we're often hardest on ourselves when it comes to our role as parents. I pray that tonight, through the truth of your word, you could relieve some of that guilt, some of that sense of failure, and that we might trust our children into your care and realize that you are watching over them. They will ultimately answer to you and that you are waiting for them to come to yourself. I pray for the children and the grandchildren represented in this church family tonight. Many of them are not walking with you. Many of them are not following your son, Jesus. And it is our prayer that they may. But we also understand that in the end it's their choice. And a choice for which they will have to answer. Go with us now, I pray, with some divinely ordained relief. We pray in Jesus' name.